Hi, this is Dan Sullivan. Very, very pleased to welcome you to our next episode of Exponential Wisdom with my great friend and the person who constantly shocks my brain, Peter Diamandis. Hey, Dan. Hi, Peter. See you, pal. I'm telling the total truth there that that's why I made the relationship 25 years so I can adjust to all the shocks. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter, the enormous amount of talk about AI, artificial intelligence. You know, I'm a web surfer and I probably come across five new breakthroughs a day at being applied to one thing or another. And a lot of the people who are really in advance in Silicon Valley are now getting very, very worried about the impact of AI on humanity, really, if you want to talk about humanity. You've been giving a lot of thought to this, and you've been talking to other people who've given a lot of thought to this. And you mentioned something just before we came on about what countries should really concentrate on here. Let's have that be our jump-off point for this one. Sure, happily. A couple of thoughts here. One, to quote Neil Jacobstein, who heads AI at Singular University, he says, it's not artificial intelligence I'm worried about, it's human stupidity that concerns me. <laughs> and I do believe that. A lot of the top AI researchers that I know do not have this sort of Terminator expectations in the near term. So I don't either. I think AI is one of the most important inventions the human mm -hmm. race is going to ever create and its ability to serve us. But the bigger picture is what a friend of mine, Brian Johnson, talks about. He was the founder CEO of a company called Braintree that he sold for $800 million to PayPal. He's one of my innovation board members. He is at XPRIZE. He's an investor in planetary resources and human longevity. And he just committed north of $100 million to his newest company called Kernel. And Kernel's focused on brain-machine interface. Brian likes to say it's not about... AI versus humans, it's about HI, human intelligence. Mm -hmm. And that over the next couple of decades, we have the ability to enhance human intelligence and that the most valuable asset of a nation is its intelligent people. Mm -hmm. Because that human intelligence ultimately creates everything mm -hmm. and creates the GDP. And it's not the muscle power. You know, if I had to choose between a country of smart people and a country of strong people. Mm -hmm. You know, strong people would have been the ruling class a thousand years ago, but today it's geeks. <laughs> the thing that I'd like to reflect back here is a favorite book of mine by Julian Simon, who wrote a book called The Ultimate Resource. He makes what I think was a very definitive statement. He says, when you think about it, there are no natural resources on the planet. There's just one, actually, and it's called human ingenuity, yeah. because it's only human ingenuity that makes anything else on the planet into a resource. That's what I think about there. It's human intelligence, but it's really human intelligence in a particular type of activity, which is basically coming up with new stuff and being able to utilize new stuff to enhance everything in the human environment. So I think that it's a active principle, human intelligence. It's not just a test score or something like that. And it's doing something which is uniquely human. And so much of the way humans are trained is actually for them to kind of be lower grade machines, you know, yep. repetitive work, repetitive thinking not introducing any new factor into a situation. It's factory workers, machine line workers. Yeah, and yeah. there's a, something, and this ultimately hits a lot on education and what form education is going to take on because there's native intelligence and then there's what you can do with native intelligence through proper training and proper education. I started first grade in September of 1950, I had a nun, I went through Catholic schools, and Sister Mary Josephia, <laughs> uh, and I remember her, she was about five foot two, and you didn't mess around with her, because we were all about four foot two, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she said, the reason why you're going to learn what I'm teaching you this year and every other year is because 12 years from now, when you go out of high school and you go into the workplace, because very few people went to college then, she said, you're going to be required to know everything that we're teaching you. And you know something? She was accurate, 
But I say that there's no first grade teacher today that could make any kind of prediction like that. Absolutely right. For what's going to happen to the children in first grade, what's going to happen to them 12 years later or 16 years later. All the prediction has gone out of the educational system. Yeah. I mean, I've got predictions I can make about the demise of the educational system. Yes. So when you think about human intelligence being the major asset of a nation, two thoughts come to mind. One is in a lot of countries like Sudan and sub-Saharan Africa, where there's severe drought or, or malnutrition or war, where children are undernourished or in India, and your brain is developing while you're in utero and in the first year or two of life. And if you don't get the proper nutrients, your IQ can drop from 120, 110, 100 on average down to 70 or 80. And that's a massive loss of productivity for a yeah. country. Yeah. And people don't really recognize that. Yeah. The second point I want to make is, and you and I were there together last year at Abundance 360 when Ray Kurzweil was talking about his prediction for the early 2030s, 15 years from now, not far from now, when his prediction is we're going to start to connect the brain, mm -hmm. our frontal cortex, our neocortex of our brain, connected to the cloud, which would allow us to enhance our individual intelligence. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to memorize anything. It's all available in the cloud. I have to just think about it and it pops up into memory where I can like mm -hmm. increase my intelligence a thousandfold so I can be witty when I'm speaking to you. Yeah, I mean, oddly enough, I always feel that the greatest breakthroughs in any technological development happens on two fronts and maybe three fronts, but the two fronts are toys. In other words, things that people use to play with. So I can imagine brain-enhancing games that people would play. And there's a lot of talk about the fact that the interactivity with games right now is actually raising people's IQ. The other thing is warfare, uh, weapons, the military. The military always gets ahead with this. And in the new X-35, the new plane that the United States is bringing out, it's amazing how much the pilot is actually guiding the plane with his brain. Hmm. There's the greatest connection ever between the pilot's brain and the technology on the plane. There's this movement, and of course, there's an enormous amount of training that goes through that their mind doesn't wander. You know that they oh. they have to do that, but I suspect that. And of course, <laughs> and of course, the third area where everything moves ahead very quickly is porn that you talked about. I don't take that lightly or vulgarly. I said, well, it's an area of human activity that really elicits some of the strongest emotions and strongest hormonal changes. There's probably advancements being made in that area. Peter, just to bring it really home and personal here, how do you approach this? You're a smart guy. Unless Nick Nanton was lying on the video, you were really smart early. And I, I just wondered, one is, what have you done recently to actually enhance your own intelligence. And the second thing is, again, bringing it at home to your own family. If there's advantages to be had, you'd probably start with by bringing them to your own family. What would you do? Right. Because it seems to me it's going to happen on a personal level before it can happen on a group or a societal level. Yeah. I mean, so you're forcing me to dig a little bit on this. I think, honestly, my skills and my abilities are a function of my passion for space. Mm -hmm. I was just one of those lucky people that early on in my life got this jolt of excitement and passion for Apollo and Star Trek. And we talked in previous conversations about moonshots and that are you know driving you to 10x bigger. And so I'm constantly putting myself in really challenging, difficult situations mm -hmm. that I could easily screw up. Yeah. When you put yourself in that kind of a very challenging situation, it forces you to learn. It forces you to be at the top of your game constantly. As soon as I get relaxed and things are easy, yeah. it just means I have time to start another company or two. Yeah. And that habit, I think, is always pushing me. Yeah. Being scared is actually great for the brain. Focuses the brain. Not paralyzing scared, but extremely challenging, scared. And one of the things that I do is as I just commit myself for long periods of time 
to continually produce certain results. And one of those is that, you know, my commitment to write 100 books in 100 quarters. Yeah, I love that. Not even knowing how I was going to pull off the first one for the first quarter. And it's quite amazing what has happened to the teamwork around me just because I have that public commitment because I made it very publicly. And I think the other thing is to do it publicly, to announce things and challenge yourself publicly where you can visibly and nakedly fail. Your credibility as an individual is at stake, you know. You're bringing the ship. Yeah. One of my mottos, and it's been reinforced since I've known you, I says, give death no assistance. (laughs) I say, you know, death's been around a long time. It's totally operating in its unique ability. It knows what to do. It doesn't need any assistance for me. But I'm a fitness fiend. You know, I'm always working out. I'm always exploring new fitness things because they know the amount of oxygen you get to the brain. It may not make you more smart, but it certainly keeps you from getting less smart as you go along. And I know you're exploring stem cells because there's major impact. They're using stem cells now certainly to heal brain damage and to rejuvenate brain damage. But I think Ray Kurzweil is probably pretty close. And probably, for all we know, it's already being done where implants are being put, Wi-Fi implants are being put into the brain to stimulate certain areas and keep things going. So, And it is. And I can tell you it's happening in a number of places. And Brian Johnson's company, Colonel, he's working on that. I think they're in human trials right now. Their goal, you know, the hippocampus of the brain is the memory center. Their goal is can they, in fact, create hippocampal implants that can understand the neuronal code and allow you to augment memory But eventually, the question is, can you either on top of the skull or on top of the scalp or under the scalp on top of the skull or above the dura or on the surface of the cortex, can you put sensors that allow a much faster input-output? I mean, the challenge is that our I.O., our input-output, is really slow. Yeah. Talking and listening compared to gigabit per second data rates of computers is blindingly slow. It's crazy. So I think that's the opportunity. And it seems to me that going back to the original conversation, that governments at some point are going to realize that their ability to augment their citizens and make their citizenry more intelligent is going to be important. And it's not about AIs developing and just taking off. I love the movie Her. Do you remember the movie Her? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's actually my favorite AI movie because it's a non-dystopian movie. Yes. You know, this AI develops, she's got a great personality, he falls in love with her, and one day she's apologetic because her and her fellow AIs are going to leave the planet and go someplace else, which is exactly what an AI would do. Yeah. There's no reason to sort of decimate this planet, for God's sakes. So there's 700 quintillion planets. I just read the research. 700 quintillion planets in two trillion galaxies in this universe. Yeah. Lots of real estate out there. No yeah. reason for them to hang out here. Yeah, and the fact that robots would be killers is just human projection. I mean, if they were super smart, why would they want to be wasting the resources? But to come back to, well, any notion of how this develops, because I've got a rule for game changers. One is that it doesn't work for a million people unless it actually works for one person. You know, you got to start with one. And I know there's some just common sense factors that you can alter. And my big push for free time, my feeling is that if people are scheduled end to end and working all the time, that there's parts of their brain that are just going to go stagnant because there's not enough variety actually happening. They're not getting enough change. In my own case, you know, I really take advantage of technology like the Vasper machine, which has an enormous impact on hormonal release inside the body. I know I'm really brighter for two or three hours after Vasper. I can feel it. I can feel my attention is better, my retention is better when I do it because there's big hormonal shifts that happen with the Vasper machine. I just ordered some headphones, which are called Nirvana headphones, and they put a vibration in and they tap right into the vagus nerve And you basically pump dopamine for a half hour. 
I think better thoughts when I'm feeling real, real positive and I'm feeling real happy. So I'm going to test it out. Let me know. I'd love to know. Yeah, well, I might have them with you because we ordered them last week, so Babs and I are getting it. Great. But we already meditate, you know, normal meditation for 45 years. I've already done this every morning. How long do you meditate for, Dan? 20 minutes, as I was trained. Yeah. It's TM. You know, I learned TM yeah. 45 years ago, but I'm faithful about it. I get up in the morning and I meditate. And then six years ago, I went on Adderall for my ADD, and it was a profound change. I have to tell you, the first time I popped a pill... All of a sudden, things went real quiet. For the first time in my life, I realized my whole life had been noise. Wow. And very distracting noise. For the last six years, I've lived in a totally quiet world within about eight hours after I've taken. So I think some of it's going to be chemical. I think, you know, as you said in the exponential wisdom when we covered reproduction, they're getting a handle on what are the smart genes. You know, they're starting to get a handle on smart genes. If CRISPR-R proves to be trustworthy as we go along, you might be seeing some cell re-engineering after people are born to make them smarter. Yep. But I think just putting this out as a major narrative about what countries ought to be thinking about, you know, if we're going to go back to the sovereign model, inside the sovereign model, let's have them be really smart people. You know, I think that's really what you're talking about here. Yeah, I mean... Right now, all of us have become so dependent on this, right? This is our window to the cloud. We can look anything up. We can perform kinds of calculations. We have yeah. all kinds of apps. These are enhancements outside of our body. But I think I have no difficulty believing what Ray Kurzweil says that, you know, we're going to have nanobots, in the words nanoscale, 10 to mm. minus 9th meters scale robots in our brain that are able to connect to synapses and connect to the cloud so that when I think, I just know. In other words, the information is called on from the cloud, it's delivered to my brain, it doesn't have to go through my eyes, and, and if I need additional computational power, I can send off tasks and get the answer back. I mean, we're talking about the evolution of a new hmm. species yeah. of humans in that regard. It's a merger of humans and machine that to many are a scary thought, but I believe that over the next 20 to 30 years, very soon, that we as a species are going to undergo a transformation, that we're becoming something completely new on, on almost every level. Well, I'm sitting here because we're doing our podcast on the screen here so we can see each other. And I know I'm looking, as I look into the screen, I look at one of the first test people that's actually going to get the implants. As soon as I can, baby. <laughs> as, yeah, I'd like to, you know, because you just came back from Panama. and Yeah, let's talk about that next. A lot of people have been saying, uh, what happened on the Panama trip? So I said, well, we're going to do it. <laughs> well, what happens in Panama stays in Panama. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, on this trip to Panama, I've gotten extremely interested in stem cells. Yeah. My 18th startup is a company called Cellularity with Bob Hariri. That's a great and one. And let's pick up on our next exponential wisdom on the concept of stem cells and longevity and what's possible there. I'll take a number and stand in line for that one because I totally believe in the concept. Peter, uh, great joy, and we're very shortly to see each other at Abundance 360. And so that'll be another thing, the report on this year's Abundance 360. So very excited. Awesome, pal. See you soon.